Thank you for joining our monthly webinar series for PMC. PMC helps businesses achieve their global business objectives through enabling their talent to enact global business objectives. Thanks so much for coming. And uh, we are going to focus today on the LGBT and Q population within the workforce. And we're going to focus on straight talk for today's global workplace. Our guest speaker today is our practice group leader for our diversity and inclusion field uh, for TMC. Uh, her name is Dr. Cheryl Williams. And uh, she is also a professor at Concordia University out of uh, Irvine, California. So we are very pleased to have her join us today. Uh, my name is Lynn Flitz. I'll be your moderator for the session today. I will handle all your questions that come in the chat box. And uh, my role is the Director of Solutions for TMC. So Cheryl and I are very happy to be with you today. We also have a producer named Lakeisha Ward who is on the back side. So I want to thank you so much, Lakeisha, for making sure that our session is working well today. A couple of uh, housekeeping items for us uh, before we get started. In order to reduce the background noise, we keep everybody on mute during the session. We do have a question box that we'd like you to use in order to ask any questions that you might have. And uh, go ahead and use that question box for any uh, questions that you have along the way or if you need some support. We monitor that uh, all the time. And lastly, uh, we want to um, make sure that you know that our session is recorded. After the webinar, we'll share the link with you. It is also posted on our corporate website, tmcorp.com. Uh, so just a quick question. I, uh, my my uh, remiss here. We want to find out what your role is in your organization. So if you could just let us know uh, if you are in the talent management division of your company, organizational development maybe, and uh, there's training, uh, business line leader as options as well. And if there's an other that you'd like to choose, go ahead and uh, fill in your answer in the question box. All right, so we have uh, the majority of our participants today, Cheryl, are other. And I'll uh, take a look at that and feed that information to you as we go. But we have the, uh, looks like the majority in training and uh, some business line leaders and talent management uh, folks joining us as well as organizational development. So our primary group is um, Sending, uh, telling us that they're in the other category. So, um, all right. So we know who's with us today. Let me hand it over to you now, Cheryl. <laughs> yes, thank you, Lynn. That was very nice. You do that so well. So I didn't want to stumble on that. Well, welcome everybody. And I'm really excited about being able to share this very timely uh, topic for all of us today, particularly as we talk about the LGBTQ community from a global perspective. Um, so here's some of the things that I thought we would share, and then we will have plenty of time at the end of this uh, session for any Q&A questions and answers that you might uh, have or comments. So some of the key topics I hope to cover is just a little brief overview about the LGBTQ community, today's global workplace, and a little bit about the marketplace. We'll go through some terminology uh, with some definitions. And by definitions, I pulled what is most current uh, around the world, what's most appropriate, what's accurate, and how we describe uh, different uh, individuals um, that are members of the community. And on being an ally, that's kind of one of the key terms today for those who may not be a member of the community uh, per se, but you're an ally, of which I certainly am an ally myself. Um, then how to relate comfortably hopefully knowledgeably and sensitively to employees and customers by using inclusive language. We'll give you some tips on that. And then as I mentioned, uh, Q&A. The resource sharing is when you receive uh, the copy of the recording, we'll have some of, some of the top resources that I use in gathering this information. All right, just a brief overview. And when you, if you were to Google this particular uh, community, Lots of wonderful, uh, very well grounded research education and, and, and comes up in helping to understand what's going on. Uh, and so the one group, one um, 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 
place called the Gay Library, which is really a well-hosted library, very well uh, appreciated, says that an estimated 3 to 10 percent of all people are gay. And right now we're going to use the, the term gay as, as, as how it's appreciated. We'll talk more about that uh, term in just a moment. And that's a worldwide, a global uh, statistic. In 2005, approximately 14% of all hate crimes were directed at gay people or those perceived to be gay. Now that's more of a U.S., a United States uh, statistic uh, that was put forth by the Federal Bureau of Investigation of our government. And then I want just to share kind of uh, another terminology that, that's come about that we get questions when I, when I conduct these classes. In 1973, that's been quite a while, the American Psychiatric Association, and that particular association is what kind of governs um, um, the, the, the medical side of, the, of, of psychology here in the U.S., as well as it has a big global footprint as well, removed homosexuality from its official list of mental disorders. In support of that action, the American Psychological Association resolved that homosexuality per se implies no impairment in judgment, stability, reliability, or general social and vocational capabilities. So that is when the uh, homosexual um, 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 orientation was said. That is something that was now more perceived as that it's, it's more part of the DNA. And they talked about that. Further, the American Psychological Association urges all mental health professionals to take the lead in removing the stigma of mental illness that has long been associated with homosexual orientation. And so that's the definition that came straight from their from their website, actually from their their writings as well. So next we go on to take a look at, um, I'd like to kind of know a little bit, something from you as so I can know how to direct some of my comments. We'd like to know two things, and if you could please type your responses in the question box. My colleague Lynn will help me with this. What are some of your hot button issues around this subject? And two, if you could ask anyone a question or questions about the LGBTQ community, what would it be? I'm going to pause here for a moment and give those time to respond to question one or two or both. We have one question, Cheryl, uh, that came into the um, question box so far, and that is, what does Q stand for? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. That was a great question, so we're going to get there in just a minute. I'm glad that the curiosity is there. Great. Another question for you, Cheryl, is um, how to encourage the LGBTQ community to self-identify to encourage positive programming in the organization. Okay, perfect. One of the things towards the end of the program, I'm, I, there's a section where I'm going to talk about what can you do. And there's three kind of categories. It's going to be called basic support, moderate support, and advocacy. And we'll drill a little bit deeper exactly in that area. So thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Sounds like you're going to hit that one. More questions. Uh, how are some differences in how LGBT is perceived or received around the world. What are some of those different uh, approaches to this community? Okay, and that too will be something. Um, these are great questions, so thanks for asking these. So matter of fact, the very next slide, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what's happening around the world. And then there's some really good um, uh, research now that's been done by some great think tanks. So because it's such a robust uh, response to that question, uh, I really encourage you, you know, to take a look at the resources that I will have prepared with the links for you to take a look and really, it goes country by country. I mean, that's how detailed I was able to get some information. But we'll talk a little bit high, high end in just a moment. Another um, couple more questions here, Cheryl, and this hopefully will just help frame uh, your discussion as you go, and that is, how can we customize the training needs on differences in the workplace? And that's the hot button. Uh, that's relating to your hot button question number one. Oh, great. Okay. 
Well, there's a couple things. Thank you uh, for that question. Uh, first of all, anytime we're developing training programs, regardless of the subject matter, uh, for different audiences today, we must take into account, for, at a minimum, generation. And in this particular subject area of, uh, of the LGBT community, you know, the millennials, how they process this, and the baby boomers, if I can use those two, those two terms, is very different. Uh, really quick, you know, uh, the Diversity Inc. Uh, Art Magazine put out a really good um, um, research study December of last year that says, you know, for example, baby boomers seem that the younger generations are ungrateful for the political and social gains that they were able to they were able to obtain during their youth. That the younger generation feels entitled, they're sexually careless, and they appear disrespectful to things. Now that kind of tracks with some of the other things of how the baby boomers have viewed the millennials. The millennials, and, and by millennials, I'm using people born between 1979 and 1994. I know that's kind of a sliding continuum. But the millennials are feeling toward this particular community, they are much less fearful of their authenticity and observe some of their older counterparts tending towards the following. They think that the older counterparts, meaning the baby boomers, <laughs> are uh, more negative, are more obsessed with talking about AIDS, that are uncomfortable or even jealous of their degree of authenticity about who they are, and they don't seem they're not mainstream enough. So you've got two kind of uh, ends going on there of just just pulling it through the, uh, the, the filter of generation. Really good questions you know, like that. I'll, I'll come back to that if at the end if you want me to explore more. I'm going to put a dot on it because I also can send even more information off-site about this. So, so thanks once again, Lynn, for those questions. So now and we have we have some more, Cheryl. So I'll leave those until the end of today's session in our Q and A um, section. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you so very much. Thank you. You bet. So what you have on the screen right now are a lot of words, but I wanted to uh, really go through this because I was hoping that I would get a question where. One might be interested in what's happening globally. So having, uh, uh, um, worked, having delivered diversity and inclusion training programs literally around the world and including the, the gay, lesbian, you know, homosexual, heterosexual topics, here are some of the most current things from a pure legal standpoint and or from a pure accepted standpoint. So areas of the world that view homosexuality as being most accepted and you can see where I have this highlighted. Uh, uh, about three quarters or more comes from the European Union, Spain, Germany, the Czech Republic, France, Britain, Italy. They tend to share more of this uh, acceptance of homosexual behavior. A little bit more of Greece and Poland uh, are the ones. You can look through that for just a moment and see where it's most accepted. You also have uh, down in, uh, if, you, if we move on to um, uh, South America, in Argentina, I thought this was a very interesting fact. In Argentina, it was the first country in the region to legalize gay marriage in 2010. And about three quarters, about 74% say homosexuality should be accepted. So if you continue to look in the South America, you have Chile, Mexico, Brazil, and about half of Venezuela. Moving on to other parts of the world, more than 7 in 10 in Australia and about 73% in the Philippines all say homosexuality should be accepted by society. And we even have 54% in Japan that's agreeing. So what should that say to all of us that's on this phone call? That should say that regardless of our political or our faith-based or our attitudes towards the LGBTQ community, uh, these, these, are, these are our coworkers. These are our family members. These are our customers. So being inclusive, making people that may have a different sexual orientation than you feel included in the workplace, engaged in the workplace, valued in the workplace, we need to be mindful of it. So that, is, that, that alone is more than just a business case of why this is a critical uh, discussion, I believe. Moving to the right side of the page, we're talking about base today, and this is 2014 information, to the end of the year 2014, so it's brand new. This is where today uh, it's more rejected. So you can kind of read that 
Republics in Africa and predominantly Muslim countries are the least accepting of homosexuality today. You may look at some of these statistics in sub-Saharan Africa, which is Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, and Kenya. That's where the highest percentages come out of where it is still considered unacceptable. Even in South Africa, where unlike in many other African countries, homosexual acts are legal and discrimination based on sexual orientation is unconstitutional, 61% say homosexuality should still not be accepted by society, or only 32% say it should be accepted. So we still have areas of the world that clearly um, are, are not accepting it, and we have areas where it's still even illegal and even criminalized. Uh, moving on down uh, to continue to talk a little bit about the African Middle East, um, overwhelming majorities in the predominantly Muslim countries surveyed also say homosexuality should be rejected, including 97% in Jordan, 95% in Egypt, 94% in Tunisia, and 93% in the Palestinian territories, 93% in Indonesia, Pakistan, Malaysia, Lebanon, Turkey, South Korea, and China all are still saying where it should, it should be rejected. I was delivering a program in India uh, just a few months ago where it's uh, legal, well, well, on the books it's, it's criminalized. However, it is being much more accepted now, and laws, I understand, are in the works of being even updated or changed. So there are parts of the world where it's certainly uh, it's growing, it's recognized. So I'll leave this a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll step away from this and go on to the next slide, but just be mindful that it is still a lot of work to be done around this around this area. Let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, accurate terminology. And I'm wanting to uh, respond to the question of Q. So here's, here's some correct definitions. Before I share these, any time, I want to be mindful that any time we try to label something that's out of, that's in humanity, it's tough because labels in and of itself can be offensive to some, misunderstood to others. So we always want to be mindful that, you know, for the most part, based on today, here's what the accepted terminology is, particularly if you were going to write about this community or if you were going to have to, to talk. But you always you want to see what, at the end of the day, what would that individual like to, how would that individual like to be referred if this becomes something that needs to be referred to at all. But the word L, L stands for lesbian. And lesbians are women are women whose primary emotional, and this is critical, emotional, romantic, sexual, or affectional attractions are to other women. So that's what so 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 that so the attraction is to other women. G stands for gay men. Men whose primary emotional, romantic, sexual, or affectional attractions are to other men. Now, the term G, often gay, is sometimes used uh, globally to mean the entire LGBT community. And that may or may not be correct or offensive to some. So I'm going to stick with what I know and what's written about and, what, and by the key organizations that use the word G. So G is, is for the gay male. B stands for bisexual. A bisexual is a man or a woman whose primary emotional, romantic, sexual, or asexual attractions are to both women and men. Now, a word about the B. A B does not mean that a bisexual is someone who goes to bed with men and women at the same time. It simply means that they have attraction for both. And that's really to need to be clear because it gets misunderstood that any time we're talking about someone's sexual identity, we immediately want to put them in, in bed, and that's not what we're talking about uh, necessarily. It's more than it's much more than that. The T stands for transgendered. A broad term that includes cross-dressers, transsexuals, and people who live substantial portions of their lives as other than their birth gender. Okay. So in that particular, the word, I'm, there's a lot that comes underneath the transgender uh, T, but I'm going to keep it simple with keeping it there for right now for what, uh, because transgendered male, transgender female, we'll talk a tiny bit more about that later on. 
And then the Q, the Q stands for questioning. It's someone who is questioning their sexual and or gender orientation. And I'm going to put a period, stop there for just a moment before we go to the second part of this definition. So what we're finding is someone who has maybe had to live a non-authentic life, uh, but, they're, but they're still questioning, are they, are they gay, are they lesbian, are they bisexual, you know, what's going on? So we call that Q, that questioning, and that's getting a lot of good um, uh, writing and understanding today. Additionally, this is kind of something interesting, the Q stands for queer. Now, this is a term that's reclaimed by some LGBT communities for political reasons. It is not meant to be the offensive way. I did include it because you'll find that that's an intra-cultural term sometimes. So you want to be very mindful if you write about it, but you might hear it. And if you hear it, you'll know, look at the context of how it's being used. And I, which is another one that you'll sometimes see, and I included that because in addition to the LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ, sometimes you'll see the I attached to that. And the I stands for intersex, or born with mixed biology. Some of you may have learned this term, some of we baby boomers, as uh, hermaphrodite. That is not a term used anymore. The term is intersex. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. That's, that's something that's different. OK, so moving on. A little bit more about some of the terminology that's considered correct and proper for today. When we use the term sex in this context, it refers to the genital and reproductive anatomy, period. Period, when you're talking about that. When we're using the term gender, it returns to a social concept of what's considered masculine and feminine. Gender role refers to behaviors that are seen as feminine and masculine, and these changes during the, it changes with, with times and what we're happening in the world. It changes with culture. What's considered a feminine or a masculine behavior in China might be different from a feminine and masculine behavior in Brazil or the U.S. or other places, as well as who's in power to change. A quick term to continue to understand what we mean by gender. Uh, particularly when we get to gender identity, by the time someone is by the time children in kindergarten, which is around five years old to six years old, children identify what is acceptable play for males and females based upon social norms. For example, gender nonconformity can have very negative repercussions if uh, if boys are called sissy because maybe they're looking like they're expressing what that particular culture is defining as more masculine, excuse me, more feminine, or if girls are called tomboys because they're expressing something that's called, that looks like it's more uh, masculine. Social differences typically don't become consciously sexualized, however, until adolescence, which is around your 13, 14, 15, and, and in some places maybe as early as 10 or 12. But same-sex attraction can result in shame, anxiety, secrecy, a low self-image, denial of feelings, and excessive efforts to, quote, act straight. And even the term straight has some, um, has some, has some, um, some, some negatives around it. Because if you use the word straight, that implies that someone that might be in the LGBTQ community is crooked or straight crooked, and that's not, that's not accurate as well. So I would be mindful even in using the term straight. A couple of more terms here. Sexual orientation describes one attraction to, desire for, apologies for my uh, misspelled word on four, uh, uh, sexual desire for lust or, um, or romantic attachment to others. It is not a sexual preference. Oftentimes, I hear people refer to the LGBTQ uh, community as having a sexual preference. You don't have a preference for that. So those of you on the call who, are, who may be heterosexual, is that your preference? That's your orientation. For those of you who may be on the call who may be a member of the LGBTQ community, then you know, that's, your, that's your orientation. And the last, referring back, gender identity is one's inner sense of oneself, a personal Personal self-concept in terms of gender 
And once again, this is not always derived from general full anatomy. OK, so moving on. In just a moment, I'm going to have a, some questions for you. But I have one more uh, comment about using the correct words. A, a quote from Brian McNaught, who, McNaught who's a very uh, well-known person that's a very advocate for the LGBT community, says, when we go to a foreign country and don't know the language, our anxiety is high. For many people, sexual orientation and gender identity are foreign languages. So that's why terminology and words are important. Use the term sexual orientation, not sexual preference. Use the terms life partner, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, not roommate. Being gay or lesbian is not an alternative lifestyle. It's a life. So you wouldn't refer to it as an alternative lifestyle. A transgender person is not a he, she, or a tranny. Those are very offensive. But instead, a transgender man or a transgender woman, if it's needed to be uh, reported. And once again, the proper word to use as an ally are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, intersex, and cross-dresser. Again, gay is who I am, not what I do. It's not a choice. All right, so next I have a question for you, and Lynn's going to help me out with this. In your experience, what are the main concerns you or your organization has as it relates to the LGBTQ community? Now, a few of the questions you asked before also address this, but if you would like to add something, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, Cheryl, one of the earlier questions we had relates to this question, so I think it's appropriate to bring up here. And that is, what, um, what can an organization do uh, to make the um, community, the LGBTQ community, feel included and allow them to be productive in their work? And you know, they obviously have to be engaged. And, how do they keep uh, this community engaged, or what kinds of um, processes or groupings do you recommend uh, that are in, um, uh, introduced in the organizational structure? There's another question about affinity groups. So maybe you can talk uh, to both of those questions at the same time. OK, great. And matter of fact, if it's OK, Lynn, that I have a whole slide on that towards the end. So these are great Excellent. questions. So once again, I yep. hold that. And I sure appreciate it. And then once we get to that slide, I'll, I'll pause for a moment. And, and if it's something additional, we can, we can talk about it there. All right. So a couple of other questions. We'll get to that uh, through the slides. Uh, a couple of other questions. What do you recommend instead of the word straight? Well, if you had the, 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 the community would write either gay, lesbian, bisexual. Um, you could say heterosexual. And the thing about the difference between heterosexual and homosexual, heterosexual is a very um, a formal sounding name. So there's really no in lieu of what to use in, 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 instead of straight. And for some, it's not considered offensive. But I do want to be mindful that in other category, in other areas, it is considered offensive because straight does imply that's a correct thing as well as so. So the opposite would be something that's seen as negative. So if you, if you, depending on the context of how you're referring and how you're using it, you either would say, you know, that you're, you're heterosexual if it comes up, uh, if you're an ally, if you, it, it really is very, it's just a very context-driven question. But thanks for, thanks, mm -hmm. Matt. It's, it's no sure. opposite of, it's no replacement term for just straight. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We have another one, and then we'll, um, we'll leave the rest of them until the end. So the other question that uh, is um, very appropriate for this uh, response is, uh, in their experience, customers may not like to openly um, uh, interact with an openly gay or lesbian employee. How do we handle that? Well, are they? Are they? Is it the? Is it their sexual orientation, or is it their behaviors? Because you might, just by looking at someone, you can't tell necessarily what their orientation is unless they're displaying in a different way. So if in that society, if a male is dressed what uh, that society feels is effeminate, 
or if in that society a female is dressed in something that is considered masculine, then they're mm -hmm. responding to the look. They're probably, they, they, they can't respond to someone's orientation until I tell you or, or I'm doing something. So I would peel it back to understand what's really going on um, that's making that particular customer or, or people feel uncomfortable. I, I certainly can appreciate that because in some areas, you know, people may come across and say, oh, I have something called a gaydar, which I always find offensive, and, and I have no idea what that is. Um, but even my friends that are members, I have a lot of friends that are members of the LGBTQ communities, and they will have it. They, they claim that they have this, and they can sense when someone is, a, is an orientation. I don't know about all of that, Lynn. You know, I hear it. It's probably more anecdotal than I can say, more factual what I've read about. Mm -hmm. So you would really, but the, the, my response to that question and what I do in, in that sense is, what's going on? What, what's really the customer or the colleague referring to that, that, that's bothersome? Excellent. Thank you for that. And uh, we may have an opportunity to revisit that uh, if, we're, if that question wasn't answered as completely as, um, as uh, you'd like uh, whoever asked that question. So okay, please let us know if you want to discuss that more. Let me hand that back to you, Cheryl, to continue. All right, thank you. We just talked about some categories that, um, and in these categories we had uh, sex, gender or gender roles, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And so what I'd like you to do is, starting with this, what descriptors best connect with the term sex? And if you could, uh, Mark, uh, please select all that apply. So the term sex refers to which descriptors? Male, female, queer, intersex, or gay? Okay, I see the top three answers, are we all in? Is that, is that, we're all done? Yes, okay. So yes, the correct answer is male, female, and intersex. I see some wrote queer and gay. We'll get back to where that's most appropriate in just a moment. All right, the term gender, gender roles, refers to what or which descriptors of the ones there? Male, female, masculine, feminine, or intersex? So the correct answer to this one, I, I see you've got masculine and feminine, yes. We would include uh, male and female, even though that's your sex. But when you're talking sometimes about gender roles, they'll talk about male, female. But so so that the, the response from the book says it's male, female. but. I kind of question that as well, because that's really just the, the genitalia, as we mentioned. Masculine and feminine for sure, but not intersex. Once again, intersex would go with the male and female. All right, so the correct answer is what uh, you've got there. I see most of you got that one right. Next question. The term sexual orientation refers to what or which descriptors? Lesbian, gay, bisexual, heterosexual, or queer? And actually, the, it, it, instead of saying, please select one, select which ones. It may be more than one. OK. <laughs> this is a good one. This is actually kind of a tricky, try not to be a professor tricky over here. But the answer to this is all of them. All of these refer to sexual orientation. So apologies for the uh, where it said uh, only a single answer, uh, but it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, heterosexual, and queer. All of those are terms or descriptors that fall under the sexual orientation category. All right, so then our last category, if we move on, our last polling question is uh, the term gender identity refers to what or which descriptors? Once again, select which ones. It, it may be more than one that uh, connects most with this, uh, with this category.
Okay. So the correct answers here is transgender, yes. Queer, yes. And then male, female. So when you're talking about gender identity, someone could maybe identify as a female or identify as a male, but it could be different from the transgender. So once again, uh, lesbian, though, however, is more is your orientation. It has nothing to do, per se, with the gender identity. So oftentimes, the terminology sometimes is a little overlapping. But once again, the correct answer here is transgender, queer, male, and female. And those are the answers. So words have power, but in the last just two or three slides, uh, supportive words encourage us, and anything that's stereotypical or offensive words demean, demeans us, so we want to be mindful of that. So next, I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, the role of an ally and to address some of the questions that uh, were asked earlier. Many of you have heard me use the term ally here, and many of you uh, already know what it is, but I just wanted to give you a definition of what this could be. And this comes straight from, once again, some of the um, organizations that's most respected. And there is that word straight again. Be mindful that in some areas, straight is OK, but if you want to be careful because to some, straight could be considered offensive. A straight ally or heterosexual ally is a heterosexual and or cisgender person uh, who supports equal civil rights, gender equality, LGBT, social movements, and challenges homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. So once again, back uh, what an ally does, uh, is someone who can see the bottom of this definition, someone who confronts, once again, these, these different things. And the middle of that definition says, a concern for the well-being also of lesbian, gay, bisexuals, transgender, and intersex people, and this belief that heterosexism, homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia are social justice issues. It also uh, marries nicely with the definition for what a cisgender person is. So next, as we move on, I'm wanting to address some of the early questions I think Lynn was asked about. So what can we do? So the next three slides, I'll, we'll move quickly through, and then I'll open it back up for questions. The first thing is tips for success are the qualities of an ally. And you saw me, I had that little badge uh, in the prior slide and on my opening slide that I just took from one organization. I actually have that slide even on my Facebook page. And for me, that's a personal thing. But here's these seven key tips. Accept everyone regardless of their orient sexual orientation or gender identity and expression. Why well, wouldn't the world be better if we could all do that? Be passionate in advocating for an equitable work environment. Being mindful of that number two, that in some areas, uh, if you are a member of the LGBT community, it's sometimes sensitive to act as an advocate because people feel as if it's self-fulfilling. Well, that's a personal question for you. Is that OK? For me, that's OK. I've, I've decided that I'm going to be an advocate uh, wherever I can be at all times. Possess a strong sense of self. Be culturally competent in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender issues. Understand what's going on legally and socially in your areas. Possess a clear understanding of the legacy of heterosexism and homophobia. Understand that all the way back to the to, to history. Demonstrate and model workplace behaviors and attitudes through your everyday words and actions. In other words, I don't listen in on jokes. I don't. Uh, I correct people subtly but nicely when they use misuse of words and be well-trained and committed to personal growth. Continuing on, the next slide will uh, bring us some information on some of the concrete steps to take. And I'm mindful of my time, so I won't go into detail. But once again, it will be I can um, put the link on here. But there's three kind of areas when you're talking about uh, workplace equity. What can you do? Basic support is inclusive of making a point of using inclusive words, such as partner or spouse, or some of the terminology I talked about earlier. Earlier, uh, placing a, a rainbow flag sticker, a button if you're comfortable someplace. You know, attend ongoing uh, diversity training and programs. Those are some of the basic things. So moderate support is once again correcting anti-gay jokes or slurs, using the correct words, uh, supporting equitable treatment and company policies, offering to review employment and product collateral, making sure that you have uh, all uh, images that are going out being being viewed. And then moving on to the last of the advocacy steps, join your employee resource group. 
join the diversity council, be mindful of those things, become a workplace trainer on LGBTQ issues, and look for opportunities to speak publicly about your journey if you are of, as an ally or if you are a member of this, uh, of this community. Volunteer to work with your company's training department to review or develop a training program in your workplace. And once again, certainly encourage your company to be an advocate for local, state, and national uh, legislation that supports uh, workplace equity around these issues. So if you are a member of this community, recommendations for you. Sexual minorities, which is the term we kind of refer to as, take active roles in your employment searches and careers to minimize discrimination and unfairness. In other words, organizations that you know have already um, uh, uh, no, are known to be very open and very inclusive, uh, they'll get the best talent. That's one way. Determine which organizations include sexual orientation and domestic partner benefits uh, and non-discrimination policies. Consider using job referrals from friends and allies, and once again, making conscious career choices. And resist being channeled into jobs that others perceive uh, as appropriate for those who are gay, unless these occupational choices happen to coincide with what you're wanting to do. And that's being mindful where sometimes, unfortunately, the stereotype that uh, gay males make good decorators. That's just kind of one, one, uh, one um, uh, could be a stereotype. It also could be a reality. The next for recommendations for organizations, support sexual orientation diversity by including it, uh, sexual orientation in your organization's non-discrimination policy. Uh, I mentioned uh, offering benefits, uh, equal benefits to domestic partners, seeking top management support. Um, circumventing employee resistance through training, education, and discipline of those who would persist in discrimination and exclusion. And last but not least, benefits of a supportive em environment we all know is, includes employee engagement, increased commitment, job satisfaction, a cost reduction, uh, resource acquisition is better, creativity, as well as marketing. And on that note, I would like to turn it back over to my colleague, Lynn. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I appreciate the time, and uh, we'll get to the Q&A. In just a second, I wanted to make sure that everyone on the line here uh, understood that this is a monthly webinar series. Our very next uh, session is March 17th, and uh, at the same time that today's session uh, was held. And our specific uh, agenda will be on team findings in the global leadership forecast research that was conducted by BDI that was supported by uh, Berlitz. Uh, and TNC is an acquisition of the Berlitz organization. So myself uh, and Evan Sinclair, who is the chief scientist and, and director for the Center of Analytics and Behavioral Research for DDI, uh, will be presenting next month. So we hope you can join us 